Okay, so now that I've told you about embryonic stem cells, let me tell you a little bit about adult stem cells. And I'll tell you about the work that my laboratory does. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the biology of stem cells. So here we're going to tap into the potential of adult stem cells. We'll talk about their biology and we'll talk about these cells as, uh, as potential for regenerative medicine. So what are adult stem cells? Let's just refresh our knowledge again. These are cells, remember, of the body that can repair tissues when it's injured or when a tissue undergoes normal wear or tear. So some tissues naturally have more stem cells than others and replace its cells continuously. Examples of that would be skin stem cells that regenerate the epidermis and the hair follicles, blood stem cells that are able to regenerate red blood cells and immune cells. And in fact, every two weeks time, you've got a brand new surface of your epidermis. And of course, if you're lucky, your hair follicles not only undergo periods of rest, but they also undergo periods of growth. And uh, blood cells have an enormous capacity to continually regenerate. So other tissues, though, have very few stem cells. Those are the tissues that we were talking about earlier in the presentation, cells of the central and peripheral nervous system. In fact, it's only the last couple of years that we've even known that there are, in fact, stem cells in the adult nervous system. Pancreatic tissue is even more problematic. Doug Melton's laboratory has been studying pancreatic uh, islet formation and found that the only way to get islets is by damaging existing islets and getting islets to produce more islets. That there appear not to be any of these multipotent adult stem cells, for instance, that could regenerate an islet if necessary. And so that's one of the reasons why I spent the first part of my talk discussing embryonic stem cells. So, but for those tissues that do have uh, an abundance of adult, st adult stem cells, we can think about those types of stem cells for regenerative medicine. So the characteristics of adult stem cells then are the ability to divide to produce more stem cells. So whether they're adult or whether they're embryonic stem cells, all stem cells have self-renewal capacity. And the ability to produce differentiated tissue. In this case, for my laboratory, epidermis or hair or sebaceous glands. One of the characteristics of adult stem cells is they tend to be immature relative to their progeny. So when we study the the hair stem cells, those cells are less mature than the rest of the cells within the hair. Adult stem cells are typically multipotent and they can make a subset of cell lineages as I've just described to you in the case of hematopoietic stem cells or skin stem cells. So the cytoplasm determines the gene expression pattern that the nucleus will have. We talked about the fact that the adult skin stem cell has a nucleus and properties of gene expression that are quite different from when that adult skin stem cell nucleus is placed into an environment of the oocyte. In the case of taking the adult skin stem cell, putting it into the oocyte to make a hybrid cell that then goes on to generate embryonic stem cells, the nucleus gets reprogrammed. In the case of the adult skin stem cell, the cytoplasm of this cell is different and presents a different program of gene expression for this nucleus versus this nucleus. So even though this nucleus and this nucleus have the same genetic content, the pattern of gene expression is different. At present, the only cell that we know about and the only cytoplasm that we know about that is capable of producing an unlimited different variety of gene expression patterns afforded to all of the cells of the body is that of the egg cytoplasm. As far as we know, adult skin cytoplasm
does not have that capacity. So we'd really like to know more about what's the difference between this cell and this cell and why these cells have different patterns of gene expression and just what those different patterns of gene expression are. So my laboratory does study skin and we use that as a model system and I think of all of the various different tissues and organs of the body there's no question that nature clearly has had a lot more fun and fancy in creating body surfaces than she has in creating any of those ugly organs that are tucked underneath it and that most scientists work on. So my laboratory has been fascinated for my lifetime in skin as is all of nature and I think many of you. It's the one tissue of our body that we really feel intimate about. We see it every day. We notice when there's even the slightest change in our skin. And then of course when you consider that virtually every society of the world has adorned upon what nature has given us. And I think it's kind of interesting that often when you consider different societies and different cultures and different adornments that societies have given to their skin and their hair that one often uses appendages from other animals, the feather in many examples as a further case of enhancement of our skin surface. So that's just one of the reasons why I always like to remind my audience that you too have been interested in skin and we only go just a little bit deeper into the skin. So where do adult skin stem cells come from? During embryonic development, cells become increasingly more restricted in what tissues they can make. So back in early development, the skin surface begins to form after gastrulation of the embryo. And at that stage, there's a single layer of multipotent embryonic skin stem cells. And these cells can give rise to the epidermis, the hair follicle, the sebaceous gland. In the case of the epidermis for the unipotent stem cell, those cells exist within the epidermis and when we go from the single layered epithelium to the stratified epithelium, this is the structure of the epidermis that is going to be maintained in your adult skin and the single layer located in the innermost called the basal layer of the epidermis is going to be the only layer of cells that remains unipotent and remains proliferative. These cells are going to differentiate and as they differentiate they start to move upward and these cells way at the top are going to be the cells then that ultimately are going to be sloughed from the surface of your skin continually being replaced by inner cells differentiating and moving upward. So this is the reservoir down here of where the uh, uh, unipotent cells of the adult skin epidermis are going to be. So these are unipotent adult epidermal progenitor cells. These are multipotent embryonic skin stem cells. If adult stem cells reside within a tissue, they're usually tucked as safely and deeply as possible within the tissue. And that's a property of many different types of adult, uh, adult tissues. So stem cells of the skin making epidermis and hair and more. The skin stem cells provide the nearly endless supply of cells to replenish the epidermis and the hairs of our body. So can we isolate them? Can we coax them to become hair as well as epidermis? Can we coax them to become other types of cells without deriving embryonic stem cells by nuclear transfer into oocytes? So back when I was a postdoctoral student, I began to study skin stem cells. And at that time, I was studying almost exclusively human epidermal stem cells. 
And one of the reasons why I became a skin biologist is because skin epidermal stem cells are amongst the few stem cells of our body that have the capacity to be cultured in the laboratory and to be maintained and propagated as adult stem cells of the skin. Now I just talked about in the previous part of the, uh, of the presentation embryonic stem cells that we could culture and which maintain their properties endlessly. Adult human epidermal stem cells aren't like embryonic stem cells in that we can't expose them to neural factors and get neurons, but these stem cells can grow and be maintained in the laboratory and this is how we do it. We take these cells and we place them into a petri dish and then we provide them with medium <coughs> that is very similar to that of the nutrients that are moving through your bloodstream all the time. We then <coughs> add those cells to our cultures of skin stem cells and then we put them into this incubator and this incubator then has the right environment, the right temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the uh, temperature that our body temperature is in. And then, in addition, the right mixture of carbon dioxide and oxygen that allow us then, in this incubated environment, to be able to culture and maintain and propagate these cells. So this is what we do then. And if we now take a look, at what happens after a week or so after we've cultured these cells. If we grow these cells on plastic and now we've stained these with hematoxylin and eosin which allow us a histological stain so that we can visualize these stem cells, what we see is that these cells have the capacity to undergo division and here you can see an anaphase cell, here you can see a metaphase cell, and here we can see uh, other epidermal cells within the petri dish and these cells divide then and can be propagated. We can passage them from one petri dish to another petri dish to another petri dish and keep getting more and more skin cells. In addition, we figured out ways in which we can recreate the environment so well that in fact the skin epidermis pretty much behaves and looks like a normal human skin epidermis. And in this case down here, what we've done is instead of plating these cells on plastic, instead we plate these cells now in a mixture of collagen and fibroblasts, which creates the dermis, and then we plate these epidermal cells down on that. We let them grow to confluence, and then at confluence, we raise the collagen and plop it onto a raft, a floating raft, and now feed the cells from media below. Because your epidermis is at your skin surface, the blood vessels that are supplying the nutrients for your epidermis are actually located deep in the dermis and uh, those blood vessels then provide the nutrients and that allows the epidermis to grow. And it turns out that one of the features of epidermal differentiation is basically predicated on the fact that the cells move away from their nutrient source. And so many years ago, uh, one of my graduate students in the laboratory was studying some of the factors that are existing within the blood vessels and learned that in fact if you float these cells at the air-liquid interface, that now these cells can undergo a normal process of differentiation. And these cells up here would be the cells that in our body would be sloughed from the skin surface, continually being replaced by inner layer cells moving outward but in a petri dish, these cells have nowhere to go. So these cells keep on piling up and, uh, and um, that's really about the only difference between this tissue and the skin epidermis of our body. So we can do pretty good about recreating the epidermis from scratch in a culture dish. So what can we use this for? Well, back when I was a postdoctoral fellow at MIT many years ago, my mentor, Howard Green, developed the technology for growing human epidermal cells in culture. And in fact, way back then, in the late 1970s, he and another investigator, Eugene Bell, also at MIT at the time, devised methods in which they could adapt the use of cultured human epidermal stem cells for burn therapy to treat badly burned patients. In many cases, patients' body surfaces would be so badly burned that there wasn't enough good skin to be able to graft 
But if we took small amounts of the good skin and put those cells into culture, within a few weeks' time, we could generate many culture dishes of epidermal cells. And since they're the patient's own cells, the cells would not be rejected uh, on a graft, and therefore we could take a small biopsy from the patient's skin, place those cells into culture, passage those cells, produce more large uh, uh, petri dishes full of skin stem cells, and then basically graft those cells onto the back, for instance, or the area, the burned area of the victim, and then since it's the patient's own cells just passaged in culture, the patient doesn't reject them. They recognize the cells as self, and basically the burn is repaired. The cells that are coming from these petri dishes are epidermal stem cells. They are unipotent stem cells that generate epidermis. So the graft of these cells basically produces epidermis, but the, patient, uh, the patient's grafted skin does not contain hair follicles, nor does it contain sweat glands. But that's least of this patient's worry in a burn therapy. So the fact of the matter is that this type of technology then has been used across the world now in many various different uh, 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 burn clinics in conjunction with other classical means of skin grafting to be able to help patients uh, and uh, to be able to treat the, the most badly burned of patients. And um, I just point out to you that there are a number of biomedical engineering groups that are generating uh, artificial skin. You might have heard of various different methods for artificial skin. You might have heard of, of, uh, of various different doctors using pig skin or various different uh, other types of non-human skin. Those skins are basically used as protective means until the patient's uh, skin uh, cells can be repaired or, for instance, until these cultured cells can uh, be able to take on the patient and regenerate epidermis. Pig skin cannot be used forever on a patient. That's recognized as foreign and would be rejected. Similarly, artificial skin is useful for a transient period of time, but basically one needs to have normal uh, human cells in order to be able to, uh, uh, to recreate uh, skin epithelium. So this is one of the few uh, uh, early on successful examples of the use of adult stem cells in a clinical setting. Okay, so epidermal cells can be grown for months in a dish and forever when grafted onto a burn patient. Just show you a few examples of this. So here is an example then that was uh, taken again way back in the early days when people were just beginning to develop this technology for the use in regenerative medicine. And here is an example where the cells then were enzymatically removed from the petri dish once they were cultured and then they were grafted on to this patient's badly burned leg. All of the cells that you see encompassing this entire area here were entirely generated from cultured epidermal cells from an area of good skin taken for this patient, placed into culture, and then grafted into the bad wounded area. Again, here's an example of one of the cultures. The cells that you see in, in pink here are the epidermal cells. And when those cells were grafted onto the patient's skin, here we see a cross-section of the patient's skin from the uh, badly burned, what was a badly burned area, and now has perfectly healthy regenerated epidermis. And then if we follow this technology over time and say, well, a year later, how good is this epidermis? A year later, if you take a look at the epidermis of a normal patient and the epidermis of repaired, culture repaired epidermis uh, grafted onto a person. A year later, you cannot tell the difference between the epidermis and the repaired epidermis from culture. The problem still is that there's problems with scarring. Problems with scarring are dermal problems 
They're not epidermal problems. So scientists have long taken care of the epidermal problems using cultured epidermal stem cells for burn therapy. There's still a lot of work to go in the area of improving the quality of skin for burn patients, uh, and in particular in the area of dermal uh, repair and in the areas of generating hair follicles and generating sweat glands. So what does it take to make a hair follicle then? What I'm going to show you here is a very furry mouse. This is a mouse that my laboratory generated a number of years back. And here is its brother. Its brother looks a lot skinnier. This looks like a very fat mouse. In fact, this mouse has less fat than its brother. All of that puffiness was basically excess hair. So we can do this in a mouse. Ideally, we'd like to be able to do this with regards to help for human hair therapy. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the hair follicle. So here, again, is our schematic. This is the hair follicle, and here is the epidermis, and then over here is the sweat gland. So what do these structures do? Well, as I already talked to you about, the epidermis acts as a barrier, and the epidermis acts to keep harmful, fluid, harmful microbes out and essential bodily fluids in, and the hair follicles provide warmth protection, the sweat glands and, and spacious glands provide lubricants. So in fact, if you didn't have the epidermis and its appendages, you'd be in pretty bad shape you'd either die from dehydration or you'd die from infection. So we absolutely have to have the epidermis, which is about cellophane thickness of your skin, and we have to have hair follicles, at least with regards to most animals. So most animals, in fact, spend most of their time making hair. It's only humans that spend most of their time making epidermis. And we think, we just think that we need our hair. So all of these cells are derived from a common embryonic progenitor cell, an embryonic skin progenitor cell, which I've already alluded to in a previous slide. And in the adult, there's constant turnover and regeneration, not only of your epidermis, as I've described to you, but also of your hair follicles. And that means that there have to be adult epithelial skin stem cells. I've already talked about the unipotent stem cells of the epidermis, what about the stem cells of the hair follicle? And again, just to remind you, the stem cells of the skin, like any good stem cell, are cells with the capacity to self-renew and to differentiate into one or more tissues. So one of the big questions of the field was where are the skin stem cells and how uh, can a skin stem cell form different tissues of the body? I mean, really, when you look at these structures, the epidermis, and the hair follicle. These are such incredibly different structures. It's fascinating to me as a scientist how these structures can derive from one common stem cell. So let's find out where these stem cells are. Well, what we knew when we began this research, and this was now uh, roughly at the time of about uh, the turn of the century, uh, the year 2000, what we knew about stem cells, multipotent stem cells of the skin, is that these cells are used sparingly, uh, like most stem cells, and that they divide infrequently. These stem cells are basically kept as reservoirs of fountain of youth cells. They're able to create tissues, so the body wants to be able to preserve the stem cells, use these stem cells infrequently. Another thing that we knew about the skin stem cells and this is work that I had done back when I was a starting assistant professor at the University of Chicago quite a few years ago now, uh, ago. What I had learned at that time was the keratinocytes that have proliferative potential express keratins 5 and 14, which we had cloned and characterized a number of years ago. And so based on just these two biological principles, uh, 
Duina Tumbar in my laboratory, then in my laboratory. She's now at Cornell University uh, in Ithaca, New York with her own laboratory. Uh, the, uh, she and Geraldine Guosh, another postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory, worked out a method by which they could identify the multipotent or putative multipotent stem cells of the adult skin. So what they did was to make two genes first. One of these genes encoded an inducible repressor protein called the tetracycline inducible repressor protein. This means we can add tetracycline and induce the activity of the protein, in this case, repression of gene expression. And we took this gene and we placed it under the control of the keratin-5 promoter, meaning that this tetracycline inducible repressor protein is now going to be expressed in all of those cells that have proliferative potential within the skin. And then we made another gene, and this gene down here is a gene that encodes a fluorescently tagged histone protein under the control of a tetracycline regulatory element. So now this transcriptional repressor protein in the presence of tetracycline is going to be able to bind to this tetracycline regulatory element and drive the expression of histone H2B GFP. So now what we need to do is be able to, in step two, make a transgenic mouse that is expressing both of these two genes that we engineered. So in this case, what we do is we inject the genes into what is called uh, the um, uh, a fertilized oocyte at the one cell stage and this fertilized oocyte now has a male pronucleus. You can tell it's male because it's bigger. Unfortunately, I'm always in favor of female, uh, of the female and the strength, but basically this male pronucleus is larger than that of the female pronucleus. It's before these nuclei have fused and what we do is we inject those two genes now into the male pronucleus and obviously all of this technology has to be done under a microscope because this is at the single cell stage it's smaller than what we can see. And so then what we do is we now take this uh, injected fertilized oocyte and we now implant that into what we call a pseudo-pregnant mother. So this mom thinks she's pregnant but she's not. She's been mated the night before with a vasectomized male so not much was happening but basically she's got all the right kinds of hormones circulating through her body so she's ready for embryos but she doesn't have any herself and so we provide her with these embryos and basically now what we're left with is um, what we call transgenic mice transgenic because now they contain two genes that have integrated into their chromosomal DNA and now every single uh, uh, cell of this animal's body now basically has these two genes but only those cells of the skin that are keratin-5 promoter active that, that are expressing keratin-5 are also now going to express that tetracycline regulated repressor protein and then only when tetracycline is going to be there uh, is that repressor going to be able to function as a repressor to be able to control the expression of, of the other gene, which is basically the histone H2B GFP gene. So how does this work then? So what we're now going to do is what's called a pulse chase experiment. This was a type of technology that was first engineered to be able to label DNA uh, rather than uh, uh, chromosomal proteins. Um, many people used pulse chase experiments by basically pulsing with tritiated labeled thymidine or with brom bromodeoxyuridine to incorporate into DNA and then uh, chase it over time to look at which cells are, are dividing rapidly and which cells are dividing infrequently. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take our mouse, our bitransgenic mouse, and now what we get is in the absence of tetracycline, this repressor protein is going to be produced because it's uh, under the control of a keratin-5 promoter, so it'll be produced in all the skin cells. 
Um, but basically the repressor protein is not going to be functional because it needs tetracycline to act as a repressor. And so what happens is that this gene then is on producing lots of histone H2B GFP and those histone proteins incorporate into the chromosomal DNA and so this mouse has skin that's glowing green with histone H2B GFP and now if we take a cross section of the skin what we see is that all of the nuclei of the skin epithelia but only the nuclei of the skin epithelia are green. There are about 20 different cell types of the skin and we only have one cell type, that of the, what we call the keratinocyte, which consists of the cells of the epidermis, the hair follicle, the sebaceous glands, the sweat glands, which are basically now expressing histone H2B GFP because the cells with proliferative potential that exist within the epithelium of the skin are basically the cells that are expressing keratin-5, which basically allows uh, this protein to basically, uh, uh, to basically be expressed. Okay, so now when we add the um, uh, tetracycline, now this protein acts as a repressor protein and basically shuts off the expression of histone H2B GFP. And so now the gene turns off. So we start out with all of these nuclei green but now all of those cells that are dividing very rapidly are no longer producing histone H2B GFP and so they're going to start diluting out the label. All of those cells that are differentiating, those cells that are moving outward, being sloughed from the skin surface, the hairs that are being produced are basically all going to be lost from the skin surface because the tissues are undergoing turnover. Those cells are no longer going to have H2B GFP expression. But those cells that exist within this entire population of green glowing cells that are dividing infrequently, rarely dividing the characteristics of what we know about stem cells, those cells are going to be the only cells of the skin that are still going to retain the label, the fluorescence label, after an extended period of time. So if we add tetracycline to the animal's diet and now we wait four weeks, now what we're left with is just those label retaining cells now uh, that are keratin-5 promoter active that are expressing histone H2B GFP. And these are cells that exist within the hair follicle. These are cells that are known in a region uh, known as the bulge. These are bulge follicle cells. And these cells reside just above, uh, just below the sebaceous glands. So these would be the sebaceous glands of the hair follicle. And then uh, this is the uh, growing hair follicle that produces the hair. So these bold cells are part of the hair follicle. But as you can see, uh, these are the only cells within the skin epithelium that are able to retain their label that have the properties of being infrequently cycling. So this is just a 3D image of a section of skin and you can really see that the skin is really uh, uh, divided into uh, proliferative in, into units where every unit has surrounding epidermis and a single hair follicle and uh, every hair follicle then uh, has one of these label retaining compartments known as the bulge. So what can we do now uh, as scientists with these labeled uh, bold cells, well, uh, let's consider what the adult stem cells can do. We know that adult stem cells should be able to repair wounds as well as to, in this case, uh, uh, produce a new hair follicle uh, during the normal hair cycle. And so let's consider, first of all, whether or not uh, these cells can repair wounds. And in fact, here we've just scratched the surface of the animal's skin, and now you can see that these fluorescently labeled bold cells have basically been mobilized to move upward where they re-epithelialize the epidermis. They repair the wound that was created. And so this is one characteristic of adult stem cells, what you might expect for adult stem cells to have, the ability to repair uh, tissue upon injury.
So what's the other characteristic then? The other characteristic is the normal wear and tear of the tissue. And in this case, your hairs, as we mentioned before, uh, undergo periods of rest and then periods of growth again. So uh, after a while, you probably notice some of your hairs fall out. Those hairs are able to regrow. And that property is known as the hair cycle. So what happens to these label retaining cells then during the hair cycle? Well, what happens is that now we can see that these bold cells still remain bright green even during the activation step of the new hair cycle. And what happens is at the beginning of the new hair cycle, these cells down here called dermal papillae cells, which are specialized mesenchymal cells in the body, uh, find themselves right adjacent to this bulge compartment of fluorescently labeled cells. And there's something about these cells that stimulate the regrowth uh, of the new hair follicle. And so what happens then is that the cells exit the niche and then they rapidly divide to regenerate the new hair follicle. And we know that these cells are rapidly dividing because we basically take a look at these cells. These are characteristics of quiescent cells. These cells are no longer green. They label with a variety of different um, proliferating uh, markers such as Ki67 or basonuclein. But these cells have lost their fluorescence and that must mean that they've divided rapidly and diluted out the label. And so what we're learning then is that very few cells from the bulge are activated with each new hair cycle and when they exit they undergo rapid division. Now what do we know about these cells? Well we know that they have to be, uh, that these cells have to be derived, uh, the cells of the new hair germ have to be derived from these bold cells because now if we simply go underneath the microscope and expose them a little bit longer we can see that in fact these cells down here are in fact green, they just have much less green than the bold cells. So when they exited they rapidly divided and they lost their histone H2B GFP as a consequence of basically diluting out the label. So very few then label retaining cells are activated with each hair cycle and they exit at the base, they rapidly divide and they differentiate. So right away this now tells us that these label retaining cells of the bulge have the other property that we would expect of stem cells and that is the ability to regenerate a tissue in normal homeostasis or normal wear and tear. So we view then the bulge as a transition zone. These cells reside in a particular niche of the hair follicle and these cells find themselves in a growth and differentiation inhibited environment. And so there must be some kind of environmental changes in the niche that are activating the stem cells which are otherwise quiescent. In the course of a wound stimulus, these cells are prompted to move upward to repair the epidermis. In response to a dermal papillae or a mesenchymal stimulus, these cells are activated to exit at the base of the niche where they give rise to the hair follicle and that hair follicle then produces the new hair. So what we did next was to take advantage of the power of the ability to culture uh, various different cells from the skin. And here we could take our label retaining cells and place them into culture and ask what happens to these cells. Well, if we do that, what happens is that these cells give rise to colonies. These colonies of cells are uh, relatively uh, large colonies composed of small, relatively undifferentiated cells. And now if we pick a colony whose contents are derived from one single bold cell and we passage that colony into another petri dish, what we get are more large colonies and what that means is that basically those are properties of self-renewal. We start with one bold cell, we get a colony of cells, we passage that colony of cells and we get more large colonies and uh, basically properties that you would expect of stem cells. By contrast, if we now take those cells expressing about a hundredfold less fluorescence 
the progeny of the mold cells, and we now place those cells into culture and ask, well, what happens now? These cells, by contrast, give rise to relatively small colonies composed of large, more differentiated cells, and on passage, these cells undergo senescence. And basically, they cannot produce large colonies, and they basically cannot grow endlessly. Again, properties that are more typical of what we call a transit amplifying a cell, a cell with a limited number of cell divisions before these cells then go on to differentiate. So these data all tell us that the bulge really does appear to be a, a reservoir of stem cells. But are all of these cells within the bulge multipotent stem cells? Or is it that we simply have a bag of stem cells some of which migrate upward to give rise to the epidermis on injury, and others of which produce the hair follicle. Are we dealing with a bag of heterogeneous mixture of different stem cells, or are we dealing with a homogeneous mixture of stem cells that are multipotent? And so if you want to address that question, you have to use what is known as a clonal analysis to answer that question. You have to ask, is one bold cell capable of doing it all? So here we have our ability by virtue of the ability to culture these cells. Now what we do is we start with a single labeled bulge cell um, derived from our, uh, our bulge, fluorescently labeled bulge, and we pick one of those colonies whose progeny are all derived from that single labeled bulge cell. And the next thing we do is we combine that GFP labeled colony now with, uh, with um, unlabeled dermal cells and now we remove to do a full thickness graft of a plug of skin. We take off a plug of skin from a nude mouse which cannot make hair follicles and we introduce now our mixture of cells. So let's first do the experiment called the control of the experiment, and that is to ask what happens if we just take unlabeled dermal cells. We create a wound effectively in the nude mouse and see what happens. Well, here's our answer. Basically, the nude mouse can repair its own skin, and if we just use unlabeled dermal cells, we do get repair of the epidermis, and what that means is that the nude mouse's epidermis can grow in and fill in at the wound. And what that means to us is that basically there have to be adult stem cells that are unipotent stem cells that exist within the epidermis. And that's a good thing because you wouldn't want injury repair to be predicated on the basis of having hair. So if we now take our contents of a single bulge colony and we combine that with unlabeled dermal cells and we now graft that onto the back of a nude mouse now what you see is a tuft of hair lots of different hairs all of those hairs are derived from one single bulge stem cell and of course the hairs happen to be green uh, this wasn't really intended to be used in a uh, late night uh, bar in the bar scene, uh, but basically we could color code the hair. Uh, we could make it all sorts of different colors of fluorescence, um, but that wasn't our intention in this particular experiment. Our, our intention was to demonstrate that all of these cells basically came from that single bold cell. Now why are these cells green, you might ask? In fact, uh, aren't those cells supposed to be uh, losing their label when, uh, when they start to divide? Well, remember that we're using a tetracycline regulatory system, and in this case, what we're doing is using cells in the absence of tetracycline so that all of those cells derived from the bold cell are fluorescently green. So it takes tetracycline to be able to turn off the histone H2B in these cells. So if we now take a cross-section of the skin and take a look at what we get, what we see are green epidermis, we see green sebaceous glands, and we see green hair follicles. And since all of these cells came from a single bold cell, what that tells us is that these bold cells 
are multipotent. They have the capacity to repair the epidermis, they have the capacity to repair and produce sebaceous glands, and the capacity to make hair. They're multipotent cells able to make at least three different tissues. So how do we then isolate and characterize these cells? How did we get these cells to be able to do our culture system? Well, basically what we use is a technology known as fluorescence activated cell sorting. We can take advantage of the fact that these cells are fluorescent to be able to uh, isolate and purify them at high, uh, with high efficiency. And the way in which we do this is in step one, we enzymatically separate the epidermis and discard it from the dermis. And so basically what we have here is the epidermis. We throw that out. Now we have the hair follicles sitting in the dermis. And now what we do in step two is basically to enzymatically digest that tissue. And we make a single cell suspension of follicle cells now with some dermal cells. And of that, only a very few of these cells are green. Those are the cells that are derived from the bulge. And now we purify those green cells from all, the, all of the other cells by passaging this cell, through, uh, these, this cell mixture through what we call a fluorescently activated cell sorter. And this is called a fax machine, fax for fl fluorescently activated cell sorting. What this machine does is it basically takes the population of the cells and it identifies which ones are brightest fluorescently labeled and puts them into one test tube and takes the other cells which are weaker labeled and put them into another test tube and cells that don't have any label at all and put those into yet another test tube. And so basically by this type of technology we can purify, get very cleanly po uh, purified populations of our labeled uh, bold cells. So now, what can we do with that? Well, we can take these cells and now we can isolate messenger RNAs. If we isolate the messenger RNAs, we can produce two different, uh, uh, we can isolate messenger RNA populations from uh, the, the very brightly fluorescently labeled cells, the bold cells, and their progeny. And now we take those two groups of messenger RNAs and we can use those two groups of messenger RNAs as templates to make fluores uh, fluorescent cDNA and now we can take that fluorescent cDNA and hybridize it to microchips that contain oligonucleotides to coding sequences of genes. This type of technology now is referred to as microarray technology and what this allows us to do is to ask the question of what are the genes that these very brightly fluorescently may, uh, uh, expressing cells make relative to these weaker fluorescently labeled cells? Um, uh, what are, what's the difference in gene expression patterns? And so this uh, advanced technology now allows us to say what's the difference between bold cells and the bold cell progeny. And from this type of technology, we've come up with now about 150 new genes that are expressed specifically by the bold cells and not by their progeny. So these gene expression patterns then allow us to uh, learn a lot more about these quiescently labeled bold cells and also look at these quiescently labeled bold cells in their activated state. One of the things that we learned about these fluorescently labeled bold cells is that they express uh, a large number of different um, family members from two signaling pathways. One is known as the TGF-beta signaling pathway and the other is known as the bone morphogenic protein signaling pathway. Sounds like it should be in bone, but in fact many different cell types utilize this pathway. Signaling uh, is active uh, based on antibodies that are antibodies for, for transcription factors that are activated by TGF-betas called phosphosmad2 uh, and by factors that are activated by BMPs which are phosphosmad1. And we can tell that by using both of those antibodies that these signaling pathways are active in these quiescent cells. We can also take our cells and culture and we can expose them 
to uh, these various different growth factors. And when we do that, what we can show is that either one of these growth factors transiently withdraws the cells from a proliferative state to a quiescent state. And if we wash away the growth factors, the cells resume their proliferative activity. And so what these data tell us is that these upregulated genes, patterns of gene expression, and these upregulated signaling pathways have, uh, are, are contributing to maintaining the quiescent state of these bold stem cells. Well, we also found uh, a number of upregulated uh, uh, genes that encode for inhibitory molecules for another signaling pathway. And this signaling pathway is called a Wnt pathway. And we found that activated Wnt signaling pathway members tend to be expressed at a reduced level in these bold cells. So what's the significance of this? Well, my laboratory has been interested in this pathway for quite a few years now. The pathway was first identified in a genetic screen in Drosophila fly, where uh, Wnt, uh, the Wnt pathway uh, in flies is called wingless. And you might imagine from the phenotype that flies uh, that basically are, uh, are uh, deficient for one of these various different wind signaling members turn out uh, to have defects in their wings and in fact in something called the denticle of a fly which we think is quite similar to that of the mammalian hair follicle. So what is this pathway? So what this pathway uh, utilizes is a protein called beta-catenin. And beta-catenin has two functions. It's an interesting protein, although we're now learning that there are many different types of proteins in the body that are used for multiple different functions. This was one of the first ones that was discovered. And normally, in the absence of any Wnt signal or wingless signal, then beta-catenin sits out here at the membrane where it interacts with a protein called e cadherin and another protein called alpha-catenin and a bunch of other proteins that we're now learning about. And it basically acts in cell-cell adhesion. But in the presence of a Wnt signal, now there's a complex of various different uh, events. It's like a domino event, a uh, series of events that happen, whereby a series of different phosphorylations results in the end of an accumulation of beta-catenin protein in the cytoplasm. And this excess beta-catenin can now be utilized uh, and as a, a, a nuclear transcription factor for proteins of uh, the left TCF family of DNA binding proteins. And when beta-catenin interacts with a left TCF DNA binding protein together, that uh, protein constellation acts as a transcription factor, and together those, uh, those complexes can then activate downstream target genes. So by receiving a Wnt signal, the cell can change its program of transcription and start to express a new set of genes. So how do we ever detect in a mouse whether or not a particular cell is receiving a Wnt signal or not? When do we know that there happens to be a left, and, a left or TCF DNA binding protein available and the cells receiving a Wnt signal and stabilizing beta-catenin and activating these target genes? Well, several years ago, uh, Ramanuj Dasgupta, who was a graduate student in my laboratory and is now actually a, a faculty member at New York University School of Medicine, made a mouse, engineered a transgenic mouse, and this mouse encode, encoded uh, beta-galactosidase, or LAC-Z, and this is a bacterial enzyme. And um, he put this bacterial enzyme encoding beta-galactosidase under the control of uh, an enhancer element uh, containing multiplied left one DNA binding sites. So now, in the animals that are harboring uh, this gene, Whenever a particular cell happens to be expressing a left TCF family member of DNA binding proteins and the cell has stabilized its beta-catenin by receiving a Wnt signal, now basically these transcription factors start to be activated on this enhancer, expressing LAC-Z and now producing lots of uh, beta-galactosidase. 
And beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that cleaves a colorless dye and uh, turns blue. And so by using this colorless dye, exposing our, our tissues to the colorless dye, we can tell whether or not the cell is blue or whether the cell is not as to whether, whether or not the cell is receiving a wind signal. And so let's take a look at an example of this. And here is an example where we're taking a look at a cross section of the skin. And if we first uh, take a look at uh, whether TCF3 is expressed or not, here we have an antibody to TCF3 and we can see that TCF3 is preferentially expressed in this bulge. We can also now take a look at the Wnt reporter activity and we see just a few cells. Here are a few blue cells within these bulges um, that are turning blue. And curiously, they're only at the stage, at the, just before the activation stage of the new hair cycle where uh, the mesenchymal dermal pili cells come into contact with the bulge to stimulate a new, a new round of hair growth. And we wonder whether or not the activation of these blue cells might have something to do with that activation of hair growth. Could wind signaling be stimulating hair growth? And in fact, if we take a look at what happens then at the very earliest stages of stem cell activation to make the new hair, we see an upregulation in stabilized beta-catenin and this new hair germ ends up producing excess beta-catenin uh, as it comes into contact with the dermal papillae cells and the bulge to make this new hair structure that then grows downward and will make the new hair shaft. So now let's make another transgenic mouse that's expressing elevated levels of stabilized beta-catenin and ask what happens now again in the hair cycle now when the animal is basically expressing a little too much beta-catenin in its bold stem cells. And when that happens then now at the same stage at which dermal papillae cells come into contact with the bulge to reactivate the new hair growth cycle, now we see many more cells turning blue indicative of Wnt signaling. So these data are starting to tell us that there's something about genes that are regulated by left beta catenin complexes that are driving the cell from its quiescent state to starting a new round of hair growth. And when one thinks about how would we make a hair, uh, this type of, uh, of knowledge is important. So, Wnt reporter activity then in the follicle stem cells is hair cycle dependent, Wnt dosage dependent, and that then raises the questions, what are the consequences to that? And what happens is that uh, we can now uh, basically test whether or not uh, Wnt is an important message that stem cells need to become hair cells. And so here, just to describe the technology, what we did then was to use a skin regulator, like our Keratin-5 promoter, this time driving stabilized beta-catenin rather than LAC-Z, and uh, now asking the question of, um, of whether or not uh, we, um, uh, the hair follicles have a consequence when they're basically expressing slightly elevated levels of stabilized beta-catenin. So this is called the gain-of-function study. We're expressing an excess of stabilized beta-catenin in the mouse. So what happens in the, in the gain-of-function study? Well, the hairs still undergo their normal periods of growth. This is the wild-type uh, hair in its growing stage. This is the, uh, the transgenic mouse hair uh, in its growing stage. The hair follicles can still grow, they still produce hair. And the hair follicles still undergo their resting stage as well. Uh, at the end of a period of a spurt of hair growth, the hairs become dormant, the lower two-thirds of the hair follicle degenerates, and what we're left with is, these, uh, is the quiescent bulge just sitting there as basically the bottom of, of the hair follicle at the end of its growth phase. And you can see that the transgenic mice follicles also undergo a normal round of hair cycle. They enter quiescence normally. But now what happens is that in the presence of slightly elevated levels of stabilized beta-catenin, now the hair follicles cannot hold their quiescent state as long as their wild-type counterparts do. And so all of the hair follicles precociously say, I'm going to go ahead and start making hair follicles now. They enter 
uh, the hair cycle precociously. And so that data tells us that basically stabilized beta-catenin and wind signaling is starting to precociously uh, coax these cells to become hair cells sooner than their wild-type counterparts do. And again, this just reminds us that by beta-galactosidase reporter activity, there are more stem cells that are stimulated at the start of the new hair cycle. So beta-catenin and TCF then function in stem cell activation and we conversely then did a conditional loss of function experiment where we removed the beta-catenin gene in the adult uh, skin. And what happens when you remove the beta-catenin gene is that in the absence of beta-catenin, the stem cells can no longer uh, uh, be maintained and one loses all, the animal loses all of its hair. So if you don't have beta-catenin, you can't stabilize beta-catenin, basically all of the hair becomes lost and the stem cells cannot maintain themselves. Conversely, if you express a little bit too much beta-catenin, the stem cells are activated to make hair uh, precociously. And these data are really starting to tell us something about what controls the dormancy of these stem cells, making these stem cells, coaxing them to making hair. So in this case, instead of making a mouse expressing uh, excess protein, we remove the gene from the mouse altogether. And this is referred to as a knockout mouse. So since beta-catenin is so important to the mouse, we must engineer a mouse so that we can remove and control it in uh, the tissues uh, that we want to. And this is called a conditional inducible knockout mouse where, again, we use a keratin-5 promoter now to control the enzymes that are basically going to end up removing or excising uh, the beta-catenin gene. And then we use um, uh, an inducible system, like a tetracycline inducible system, uh, in order to be able to activate the enzyme uh, at whenever we want to. So scientists can really manipulate the mouse. That's really one of the reasons why we use mice rather than uh, humans, which obviously you can't do any of these studies for. So we're learning a lot about the hair follicle, and ultimately we hope that this work is going to be useful in terms of understanding the properties of human hairs. So when we remove the beta-catenin gene then from the mouse's skin, the stem cells do not survive and the mouse becomes bald. So what happens to the mice when we express way too much beta-catenin? Well, this really gets us into uh, the issue of hair growth. And as I mentioned to you, uh, in um, the presence of uh, excess beta-catenin, now these mice develop very super furry coats uh, you might imagine that this mouse over here is a lot thinner than its brother, and it turns out that this mouse is now able, uh, is now able to um, basically just produce a lot of excess hair. And this is the mouse that is basically expressing elevated levels of stabilized beta-catenin. Well, in this first experiment that we did, we didn't try to control the level of wind signaling at all. And, in many different types of cancers, human cancers as well, if you um, allow a growth factor signaling pathway to go, uh, to go amok, to basically just be uncontrolled, then it often uh, uh, gives rise to, uh, to cancers. And wind signaling is not any exception to that. There are many types, different types of, of tumors uh, where excess wind signaling gives rise to, uh, to the cancer. In fact, um, colon cancer, uh, familial colon cancer, is actually a case where uh, defects, not so much in beta-catenin, but in the proteins that are associated and involved in stabilizing beta-catenin are defective in, um, in colon cancer, and that leads to excess stabilized beta-catenin and excess activation of some of the genes I've been telling you about. And it turns out that in these mice, they develop uh, something called pilometricoma, and it's, a, it's basically a hair tumor. It's a hairball growing underneath the skin. Um, these tend to be benign tumors, so they're not cancerous, but basically uh, they are lumps or bumps on the scalp. 
And we went on to demonstrate that the human condition, human pilometricomas, are indeed due to stabilizing mutations in beta-catenin. So the mice are telling us something about various different human uh, disorders and uh, as well as about hair growth. So clearly, if one ever wanted to adapt uh, the activation of wind signaling um, in a clinical setting, you definitely have to be able to control wind signaling to be able to do that. But again, uh, like many growth factors, there are many ways of, of controlling a growth response. And the important thing is, is that we're understanding the beta-catenin stabilization and wind signaling, along with several other growth factors, signaling pathways are playing important roles in hair growth. So to be usefully clinically, then wind signaling would need to be very, very carefully regulated. So what I've told you is basically that it is the levels of stabilized LEF1 and beta-catenin that are determining the outcome of these stem cells. We start with stem cells at the low end of the scale where uh, uh, wind signaling or, or TCF LEF beta-catenin activity is very low. And then as we start to elevate the levels, the stem cells can become activated. But then if we really start to elevate the levels, we can push these cells into a hair follicle fate to make new hair follicles. And in fact, we can make additional hair follicles at very high levels, um, many more hair follicles than normal in that furry mouse that I described to you. And we've learned that wind signaling plays an important role in hair differentiation and actually making the dead hair cells that produce the hair shaft and then finally, I told you that if you use way too much wind signaling, that this then leads to tumorigenesis in the form of pilometricomas. So if one wanted to control the level of wind signaling in activating the hair cycle, you'd need to be somewhere around the low end of the scale. So we're also learning that there are different sets of genes depending upon how much left TCF beta catenin uh, uh, is active in a cell that there are different sets of genes that are switched on and in fact in some cases they're proliferation associated genes whereas in other cases they happen to be genes like hair keratins uh, which are basically uh, involved in producing the hair shaft. So I've now told you then in summary that the bulge is a transition zone. It contains infrequently cycling cells. They're keratin 5, keratin 14 positive. These are stem cells and what we've learned about these stem cells is that TGF betas and BMP signaling pathways maintain these cells in an undifferentiated state. And what we're learning is that Wnt signaling, along with Wnt's vari various different partners, are involved in stimulating these cells to make a hair follicle. These cells then produce rapidly proliferating cells that go on to use additional signaling pathways that we're learning about in producing the hair shaft. We've learned about the hair growth stimulus by learning methods where we can purify these dermal papillae cells. We've also engineered various different mice where we can purify these cells and we now have a good idea about what genes these cells are making and, uh, and uh, basically what types of factors those cells are producing and secreting that might give us clues as to how these stem cells become activated in these mesenchymal epithelial interactions. And so that's going to be another important aspect about understanding more about hair biology. So additional questions then that we'd like to address in the future is can we make hair cells in culture and use these for hair replacement uh, like we can for generating burns as I described to you earlier? We can take skin stem cells and produce epidermis, and in fact, we can take hair follicle stem cells and produce epidermis. We can take hair follicle cells and uh, produce hair, uh, but we can also uh, hope that in the future we might be able to, for instance, expose stem cells in culture to various different uh, hair producing uh, uh, growth factor signaling pathways and generate hair cells that then could go on to be useful in a clinical setting. And then, of course, one wonders how far can you take these adult stem cells? Could we get other types of stem cells um, or other types of, uh, of cells, such as a nerve cell? So coaxing skin stem cells to become hair cells, we think, might be something that we could consider for the future. We certainly are working on uh, this type of a possibility, as are other
researchers who, uh, who work in this area. In addition, we're learning various different growth factors uh, and various constellations of growth factors that are important in switching on or controlling nuclear LEF1 and nuclear beta-catenin, which we can already do when we place these cells in a culture dish. So now we need to know, can we learn uh, to maintain and propagate and differentiate follicle stem cells and their associated mesenchymal cells? And then how many options? Uh, epidermis, hair, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, possibly corneal epithelial cells. In the early embryo, it's the mesenchyme that dictates what type of an epithelium is going to be forming. And in the early embryo, one can take specific corneal mesenchyme, for instance, and differentiate uh, uh, non-corneal cells to be able to produce corneal cells. We don't know yet whether that's a property of adult stem cells, but if it is, these adult skin stem cells hair stem cells could be useful for uh, other potentials in, uh, in regenerative medicine, perhaps uh, treating blindness one day. That's something that scientists don't know about yet. We continue to work on the mouse to ask whether that might be possible, and again, uh, underscoring the importance of this type of research. We can already take our stem cells, as I've shown you examples of, and basically generate uh, uh, generate hair follicles in mice, and obviously we don't yet know uh, whether that potential can be realized or whether it'll even be uh, valuable uh, in, in the future in, in a clinical setting in humans. So what's the big deal about this role? Well, all of the cells in the body have the same genes, and cells, as I mentioned, um, differ by the patterns of genes they express. And so what will happen if, cul if cultured follicle stem cells are treated with nerve growth factors? Well, at present, uh, let me emphasize that in fact scientists don't think that that's going to be possible. We think it might be possible to be able to push the, uh, the plasticity of these skin stem cells to be able to perhaps produce other epithelial types of cells. We don't think it's going to be possible to take these uh, epithelial stem cells and um, make neurons. There might be other stem cells within the skin that have that potential, but we don't think that that's a potential for epithelial stem cells. Why not? Well, this gets back to the issue of what do I mean by reprogramming? We talked early on in the presentation about nuclear transfer studies, the ability to take an adult skin stem cell nucleus, place that into an oocyte, and uh, basically reprogram the nucleus to act as if it was an embryonic stem cell when we then culture the cells. Um, what is it uh, that happens in that reprogramming? And, um, and what happens are uh, basically a number of marks that are placed upon the chromosomes, placed upon the proteins, placed upon the DNA that basically give those marks history of saying during embryogenesis, with all these different marks that are given to the chromosomes, to the DNA, uh, what genes are supposed to be expressed when. That's important for our body, for all the cells in our body to function. This is called epigenetics. It's an emerging field. And what we know is that to reprogram means to basically strip the cell of all that memory of information, of different marks, uh, different post uh, transcriptional marks, but marks such as methylation, acetylation, ubiquitination, uh, phosphorylation, various different types of marks that basically tell um, the cell what genes it's supposed to express. And what you're asking in a reprogramming experiment is basically to ask the cells uh, to forget uh, what they were. And by the time you get to be an adult uh, stem cell of the skin, you've gone through a lot of marks and you've got a lot of epigenetics carried in that nucleus, carried in the DNA that is basically saying, I'm a stem cell of the skin and I ain't going to make a neuron. And, uh, and it's really that, uh, that property of the oocyte that can really do this reprogramming uh, in a way that we just don't think that we know enough yet, uh, nor, will, nor are we even optimistic that we'll ever know enough to be able to really reprogram, for instance, an adult skin epidermal cell to be able to make a neuron.
And so we don't yet know whether we're going to be able to uh, reprogram uh, skin stem cells in the future to be able to make neurons. So are there ways to get around this problem? Well, in the future, scientists may be able to engineer human embryonic stem cells from skin stem cell nuclei, as we've already done and I've already told you about with mouse skin stem cells. The oocyte cytoplasm does the best job at reprogramming the chromatin, even if it isn't yet perfect. There are multiple types of stem cells of the skin, and there may be some stem cells of the skin that have this potential. So just in wrapping things up then, I always tell my own students that their golden, the golden rule of scientists is that make sure you don't get too engrossed in the details to miss the big, the big picture. It's often when we're looking for something in science that we can't find it no matter how hard we look. And yet when we're not looking for something, that's when we most often discover something really exciting. And so that just emphasizes the importance of a broad base of a lot of different science going on in the field of stem cell research. Not only people studying adult stem cells, but people studying embryonic stem cells, people studying the biology as well as people studying the clinical applications. We need to know much more and the future looks very bright for this type of technology, but it's going to be a long time before scientists really know, will it be possible as we think it might be, as we've got it written on the books, as what it should be. And, uh, and, and re really research is the only way we're going to sift our way through the answers to those questions. But I do tell my students as well to keep an open mind, to be receptive to new ideas. And as well, we need to tell the public and teach the public of the importance of keeping an open mind and being receptive to these new ideas that are emerging and that scientists are so excited about in the whole field of embryonic and adult stem cell research. So at this point, I'm going to conclude my talk and say I've enjoyed uh, uh, talking to you today about the kind of science that we're interested in and that I'm passionate about in the science that my graduate students and my postdocs do in the laboratory at the Rockefeller University, Howard Hughes Medical S Institute at, in New York City in Manhattan. Thank you.